So they would do whatever I asked. So we could win many games, uh, get to regional championships. All those things were true, but it was very direct. It was a direct delivery. It was me telling, 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 uh, command-based, and they would jump very high if I asked them to. But that is divorced from the learning process. Welcome to the Cutting Edge Coaching Podcast, where we believe coaches are some of the most important teachers and leaders in the world, and they deserve to be supported. I'm your host, Luke Gromer, and every week we're bringing you conversations with coaches, experts, and leaders from across sports that will give you practical ideas and strategies that you can apply in your coaching to develop high-performing teams and high-character people. Coaches, I'm excited to welcome Tim Bradbury to the podcast. Tim is the Director of Coaching Instruction for the Eastern New York Youth Soccer Association. Tim has a wealth of coaching experience from the youth level through the collegiate level. He's an instructor for U.S. soccer and United Soccer Coaches. He's been coaching and educating coaches for decades. In this episode, we'll talk about effective teaching, giving and receiving feedback, enrolling parents in the process, and three keys of coach education. If you enjoy this episode and want to grab a copy of the free podcast notes, just go to cuttingedgecoach.com slash podcast or click the link in the show details to download a free PDF of notes from this episode or any episode of the podcast. Coaches, I'm excited to announce a new online workshop that I'm hosting with Doug Lamov, Film for Coaches. It's a 90-minute interactive online workshop where we're going to dive into how to use film effectively to increase the learning and development of your players and teams. The workshop will include presentations, video examples of film sessions, breakout rooms, a Q&A, and more. Spots are limited, so go to filmforcoaches.com or click the link in the show details to learn more or register before it fills up. And one note about this episode before we hop in. This conversation with Tim was recorded live at a coaching convention, so there may be a bit of background noise at times. But we did our best to edit the audio to bring you the highest quality possible. Now to my conversation with Tim Bradbury. Enjoy the episode. Coaches, really excited to welcome Tim Bradbury to the podcast today. Uh, Tim, before we dive into the questions, let's just take a minute and will you share with the audience uh, real briefly uh, a little bit about your coaching journey and where you currently are? Born and bred in Stoke-on-Trent, was a player and a coach at a very young age, a player coach who eventually became a teacher through a degree in teaching at West London Institute. I played for the British Colleges enrolled in a master's degree in sociology and education. And after one year, was offered a job on Long Island to become a full-time soccer coach with children, uh, with Long Island soccer camps. At the same time, started to do my US soccer and United Coaches old NSCAA diplomas. Went through all those courses and quickly developed into a coach educator for a private soccer company that lasted for 20 plus years. At the same time, continued to work for U.S. soccer, developed grassroots coaches as part of a group who worked for them, and continued to work for U.S. soccer as a coach educator and also United Coaches. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. And I'd love if we just started off talking about the session you are co-presenting with Doug Lamov at the convention about effective teaching. And, you know, we were talking before we started recording uh, just about coaching and teaching. And I'm a big believer that this is one of the areas that uh, coaches are woefully under, undereducated in, underprepared in, is just the ability to teach effectively and to teach well. So talk about what your session is going to be about and maybe, yeah, how we can get better at teaching. Yeah, I think to set it up, every coach goes through a trajectory as a learner and self-development becomes part of that trajectory. I'm 55 years of age and I have learned more probably in the last five years than I did in the previous 50. So as you begin to peel the onion that is teaching and coaching, you climb into all the facets of that, how we use our voice, teaching position, connection with kids, culture. I could go on and on and on. And as you research that piece, you quickly come across Doug Lamoth, who has written some tremendous books, Teach Like a Champion, Coach's Guide to Teaching is book on uh, online learning. 
And in reading Coach's Guide to Teaching, one of Doug's books, I probably quickly realized that I'd, I may have improved the performance of many players. So Crystal Dunn, who plays for the national team, was one of my players. Uh, coach for years, coached thousands of players and thousands of coaches. And in reading the book, I quickly realized that I was probably impacting performance, not learning, and wanted to dive much deeper into that. Due to the geography where I live, and Doug lives in Albany, I taught a sea license, and I, was, I invited Doug to come and observe, and he was kind enough to give me some feedback on some of my teaching. That's really interesting, and I want to talk about it. The difference between performance and learning. You said you had this realization that, man, I think I have impacted performance, but I don't know if I was actually impacting learning. What's the difference, and what were those key learnings for you? Performance in that I could, due to personality, strength of uh, nature, forcefulness, I was very direct in my delivery. I could command kids. I had a relationship with them. It was typically very good. I think they knew how much I cared. And as they always say, if they care much, you know, that they're willing to perform. So they would do whatever I asked. So we could win many games, uh, get to regional championships. All those things were true, but it was very direct. It was a direct delivery. It was me telling, 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 uh, command-based, and they would jump very high if I asked them to. But that is divorced from the learning process, which is full of trial and error, players obviously being told and guided questioning is a part of that it isn't the only part of that so Doug really opened my eyes to the fact in the book and through conversation with him that there's so much more to this learning journey I think it's really important what you just said there about direction and you shared that you know previously maybe you were on on that end of the spectrum maybe to the extreme amount of of just being directive and neglecting some of the other parts of the learning process and I think what you said that was also important that we don't need to go to the other extreme where we don't do any direct in your telling because there are definitely plenty of times and situations where as the coach, we do need to be directive. Um, we can't always be inquiring or trying to get them to discover on their own. Sometimes we do have to show them, tell them uh, what needs to happen because they might not have the background knowledge to really understand or know this thing yet. So I think that's an important thing you highlighted. But then I'd love to get into, uh, as you made that shift or, or those learnings, you know, how did it practically affect your coaching? What did you start to embrace more? Yeah, I think as you allude to, the journey, and it seems to be the same journey for everybody, and I wish there was a way to shortcut it, and that once you climb into this learning space and it's player-centered rather than coach-centered, what tends to happen is you become the Riddler. And there's a million, you ask a million questions, sometimes the questions where you know the answer and the kid doesn't and it's a guessing game. And again, that isn't effective learning, but you go through that process in order to achieve this balance point. The balance point being to help this player person move forward. What knowledge do I give them so they can learn and experiment in applying it? And what knowledge... Do I let them discover? And at which steps do I let them to discover it? So for me, it's definitely a mix. I think self-recognition, self-awareness and empathy are obviously a part of this journey. And it just struck me that as I read Coach's Guide to Teaching, there was so much detail in the learning process, which I was subconsciously aware of, but wanted to climb into more detail with. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that the self-awareness and what you said there, the empathy piece of it is, is so important for us to have as we go on that journey. You know, for most coaches, they probably aren't fortunate enough to have you know, access to someone like Doug to come watch their session and give them feedback. Um, and, and honestly, 
you know, depending on the sport, most coaches have little to no education, training, mentoring, uh, coaching that they get themselves. So what would you say or, or what advice would you give to uh, a coach that wants to get better as a teacher but isn't really sure where to start? How do we do it? I think the first thing is um, we talk about video, we talk about self-reflection, we talk about analysis of one's own performance. But for me, the key is ask your players. Typically, coaches who self-reflect reflect 70% incorrectly on their own behavior. So if I thought I asked questions, when I reflect, I pretend that I did, basically is the truth. This is a study from the UK. Uh, but if you ask your players, you get the truth. So the key in asking your players is, are you prepared and honest enough and have enough humility to ask honest questions? And are they self-insecure enough to give you ans honest answers rather than you've created a culture where they're telling you what you want to hear? I'm really glad you highlighted that last part because that's where my mind was going, that depending on the culture and environment you've created, if you ask for feedback, they may not give you honest feedback because they might not feel safe and secure to actually give that feedback to you. And so let's segue into that topic and talk, you know, how do we create a culture or an environment where they feel safe enough to give us honest feedback if we ask for it? Yeah, I think anybody who's been paying attention is quickly aware of the strength of your connection is how effective your team will be. And therefore, culture is at the heart of this. I, as a group who do a thing called Tribe from England, basically say that coach, uh, teams can improve up to 70% more effectively if you get the culture right. There's no practice, no X's and O's that will help you do that. But if you can build a culture with psychological safety, where kids know that, and that the way I do it is to ask kids five values. So they sit in pairs, they create the values at the foundation of their team. And typically, they're saying the same things. Honesty, caring, communication, hard work. It's all the things, I mean, you can call the shots. It's all the things we would hope for them to say. But all those things are things that rely on this honesty. And once you've created these core values and you have them live them in sessions, so we talked about honesty, are you being honest with each other? Are you being honest with me? Uh, I think it's an easy, dy that sounds incredibly crass, but it's an easy dynamic to set up and control. Yeah, I love what you shared there about getting them in pairs, asking them for values. I, I've done similar exercises, and the the funny thing about it is, is they usually generate exactly what you would hope that they would generate. And it's this ironic process of when we give them some ownership and control, we actually can get what we wanted in the first place uh, to a greater level. Because you talked about the reality of how important a connected team is. So I, I'm curious on that note, you know, that values exercise, are there other things that you do really practically with the teams you coach or that you encourage the coaches you educate to do to build a connected team? I, you know, I think it, it is absolutely a ton of small interactions and moments that build on each other, but are there other practical things that we can do? Yeah, I think too many people create core values, put them on a chart, and they never speak of them again. I think you have to help them live them and breathe them. So you have T-shirts with them on. You have supporting quotes that they found. When they come to practice, you ask them, how did you show some perseverance at school today? So it becomes, they have to be able to articulate how they lived the value. And if you do that sufficiently enough, so you can even prime practices or you pick up exercises where you know frustration may come out and therefore self-discipline is important. Uh, and they just become great talking points. Yeah, I think that's really powerful. I, I like that example too, of just challenging them to consider where have you seen our values lived out in other contexts? Where have you done it? Maybe where have you seen a teammate do it or maybe someone even not on our team? Where can you share an example of that? You know, one of the things that I've tried to be really intentional about lately in my coaching is, is that on my practice plan, one of the things I'm taking notes on throughout the practice are things I want to celebrate at the end of practice. 
And so I'm jotting down things around uh, kind of our team identity that they agreed to that I want to make sure at the end of practice or sometimes in the moment to stop it and do it um, at the end of practice. I'm saying, hey, uh, Tim, I loved the way that you did X, Y, Z. You know, that was totally in line with who we want to be um, and just celebrating, celebrating those athletes in front of the whole team for living out those values, I think is, is so, so, so key. Yeah, I think growth mindset has to be mentioned as part of this. Growth mindset in the normalizing area. So, yeah, we've got these core values, but I, as your guide, I, as your coach, I recognize that sometimes I'll fall short. So we talked about honesty and practice, but I find a moment where I feel I've got to praise a kid. So it's dishonest praise, which is common in youth coaching. This good, great cheerleading piece. Kids see through that pretty quickly. But if you're honest enough to stand in front of them and say, for the right, I got this wrong today. I think I sold our value short. Those moments of humility and honesty are enormously powerful in building the culture. That's such a great point. Yeah, one of the most powerful things to build your culture for sure is just moments of authentic vulnerability from you as the coach, where you say, guys, that's on me. I messed that up. I wasn't good here. I'm, I'm going to be better tomorrow. And even just sharing, uh, even proactively, hey guys, this is, these are the places I'm trying to grow. My stoppages were terrible last practice. I droned on and on and on, and you guys were bored. I'm committed to having 30 second stoppages today. Um, sharing those things, I think, like you were talking about with the growth mindset, is, is one of the ways that we instill it, is that we model it, that we show up and we recognize. Um, how we can improve and grow as a coach. We share that with them. We're willing to own it when we don't. Uh, because I really believe that that becomes contagious. Environments I've been in as an adult and as a player where that's a thing, it's contagious. People want to grow. People want to get better, but we've got to model it first. Yeah. And same as if you hide. If you start to hide your mistakes, camouflage them, that quickly becomes a disease that spreads through the team as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and that just makes teaching and learning so much harder. If, if your athletes are trying to hide their misunderstanding or errors, man, teaching's a lot harder than if they're willing to say, coach, I've got no idea what to do here. Yeah, it's better to thank them for the mistake and say, you've given me an opportunity to help you grow. Mm, I yeah. appreciate the effort. This is something I think I can guide you in. So thank you for being so vulnerable and honest with me. Yeah, yeah that's really good. That's not the norm for how coaches respond to errors. And no. mistakes typically, but I, I yeah people walk the walk. They don't talk the talk. They talk the talk, but don't walk the walk. And that you talk to coaches who say they've got a growth mindset, and then you go and watch them coach a game. And as soon as a kid makes a mistake by passing it to the goalkeeper, as an example, to use my context as a soccer coach, quickly the twos hold off and scream that. Whilst all through that process, the coach says, "I've got a growth mindset." So. And you have to take it on, be authentic, live it. Yeah, gosh, yeah, that's, that's so important. And I think one of the reasons that, you know, that example you just shared of athlete or player plays it back to the goalkeeper and doesn't go well is that as coaches, if we don't regulate our own emotions, you know, sports are so emotionally charged, so emotionally hyped up, we're competitive, we want to win. That's not a bad thing, but it can easily hijack our mind and our emotions and make us behave and respond in ways that aren't aligned with who we want to be. Yeah, it's the layers of being an effective teacher that I alluded to before. Emotional intelligence is certainly one of those layers that you need to explore deeply. Controlling your emotions, recognizing emotion in others, understanding why you have those emotions. And I think perhaps more than any other area, it's something that has become obvious to me over the last five years. Yeah, let's, let's talk more about that, emotional intelligence. Where do you see, because you're educating a lot of coaches, where do you see typ coaches typically struggle in this area and how can we improve in it? I hate to say it, but the first thing is awareness in that too much of it is coach-centered. So it's about them anyway. So if it's about me, it doesn't matter if I'm angry or sad or it doesn't matter if I'm angry and I take that out on you because it's about me. 
First thing is to give the kids ownership. The, ki- the teams are their teams. It's their party. You're lucky enough to be part of it, but you're a little part of it. And if it becomes about them, creating this culture, keeping them safe, managing your own emotions, then becomes really important. So I think there's some stepping stones you have to go before coaches take emotional intelligence seriously. And I don't think many explore the fact that it's certainly an area we can all improve in. Yeah. And I love the foundation of that in that it's their team. It's their experience. It's not about you as the coach. And that is sometimes maybe an uncomfortable realization for a coach because, and, it, and it's not wrong or it's not bad, but we're human beings too. As coaches, we have aspirations um, of, of being great at what we do, wanting to succeed. But when we let it become about us and not about them, well, it becomes really hard to stay emotionally regulated because we're attaching our success or self-worth or identity to the performance of 10, 12, 15, 16, 18, 20 year olds yeah. in a game that's full of mistakes and errors. And part of that discussion becomes winning becomes all important. And as soon as winning becomes all important, then learning unfortunately gets put in a second position. Yeah. Let's say, say, say more about that. How do we balance that? Because we do want to win and it's important to perform well. How do we balance winning I think winning you strive to realize that absolutely ultra competitive. We should always play to win. We'll always do what we can to win. We'll always hopefully work harder than anybody else. You're back to the core values. We'll always try harder, all those things being in place. I can't control winning. I can probably control how much my players develop the type of game they play, whether, again, to use my context, it's a possession-based game, so everyone's touching the ball. Everyone's touching the ball. Everyone's developing. Everyone's making decisions. If we play that way, I'm helping you fulfill your potential as an athlete. I'm helping you fulfill your potential as a player because you're being brave on the ball. You're making your own decisions. You're autonomous. And if you get that part right, player development takes the priority, and after player development takes the priority, Eventually, you win. So I coached Crystal Dunn's team from 10 to 17. At 10, they lost every game. 11, they lost most games. By 17, they were ranked one in the country. So it's a tale that tells its own story. Yeah, and I think that it's important to remember that as coaches, that it takes, takes time. And, you know, you were in a unique situation. I know it's not the situation for every coach and every club and every sport, but you got to follow this group, you know, from that time there are 10 through 17. I think it's particularly challenging for coaches when I just coach this team for one year, right? I've just, I'm coaching these group of 13 year olds one year and I'm never going to see them again. Maybe I'm still part of the same club. Maybe they're, you know, the next team up, but there's, I, I, I can't even, <laughs> I can't even imagine the connection, the culture, the, the level uh, that you were able to take that team to over seven years or eight, eight years, right? Because there's it's just so much time with them where you get to build. It was an that. incredible journey, and the parents who supported that group were fairly unique in that from 10 onwards we talked about don't worry about winning. We'll always try to win. Player development, your kids' development will come first for me. Their desire to love and play the game will come first. Mm-hmm. It was just a unique group of parents. The more I reflect on that experience, the more I take my hat off to the parents who supported it because they were absolutely full of belief in me and the journey that we planned for them. That's really good and so important. And I think worth maybe spending a few minutes talking about the other side of that and maybe the beginning of what you did with those parents. You know, how do we enroll parents in this philosophy of long-term development and a focus on learning and growing? Great question. And the answer for me is a simple one. I always have parents reflect on the first reason they had the kids play sport. So before they get to competitive level, 
when they first send them out the door and they will all say, well, I wanted my kid to have fun. I wanted my kid to learn skills and I wanted my kid to get some discipline. So they've got this original set of reasons that they're chasing. Those set of reasons don't get thrown away when the kids are nine and 10. It should still be, I want my kid to learn skills. I want my kid to handle disappointment. That's all right. Your kid learns how to handle disappointment. What a great life skill. So as long as you're putting the right values at the front, the right developmental quest, I believe you can get parents on the right page. Yeah, I, I totally agree there. And I think one of the things that's really important too is to you know, highlight, celebrate, communicate to those parents when it's happening. You know, maybe it's a weekly email that you send out. Maybe it's just having an intentional one-on-one -on -one conversation with a parent where you say, I just wanted to let you know that I have saw your son or daughter develop real empathy in the last few practices. This situation happened, and this is how they responded. Um, that's not how they would have responded a few weeks ago. Make a great point. The frequency of the parent connection is essential. Most coaches say, well, I connect with the parents, and it's like once a year, twice a season. That's not a conversation. Conversation is weekly acknowledgement, weekly conversation. This is what we plan to do in today, today's game. This is why it went south. This is why it went well. This is how they're progressing. This is what I noticed in today's game. And finding times to express that to the individual parents is key on a regular basis. Yeah, and when, when you were coaching that team or the coaches your, teams you're coaching still, are you doing that via email primarily? Are you you know, finding a time to talk to all the parents in person outside of maybe a beginning of the year team meeting? Bit of both. We have the social apps, WhatsApp or whatever they're called. So there's some communication through there. But parents know they can call me any day. They can speak to me any day. They can text me. So I try and open as many forms of communication as possible, which I think in this day and age is key because everybody's got their own favorite little mode. Yeah. yeah. My job is to be accessible on all of those. I still believe firmly in eye to eye where we're talking one on one. So we do a whole variety of methods for way of communication. That's good. Really good. I want to shift a little bit and talk about your work developing um, the U.S. grassroots soccer curriculum and really about, you know, how do we design a developmentally appropriate sport experience for athletes? I know that's broad and big, but I would love to know your thoughts. Let's deal with it in two little separate segments. So the grassroots, there was 12 of us, US soccer reached out when they were developing grassroots education to 12 educators around the country that they thought had a, a certainly enormously invested in the process, wanted to improve it. A dissatisfaction with the fact we were losing 70% of the kids by 13 in soccer. Much worse in other sports, by the way, but it's another conversation. So 12 of us spent two years talking about methods, what was, I mean, holistic learning, player-centered learning, uh, several meetings in Chicago, hats off to US soccer, invested a lot of money and flying us all over the place. Uh, but to be involved with 12 of the, I consider to be great educators throughout the country was a privilege for me. And it was a great journey. Yeah. So tell me about some of that. The, the, the things that you guys as a, as a group determined were uh, essential to reverse that trend you talked about with kids dropping out in soccer and other sports and being such a high dropout rate. Yeah, you're back to the coach-centered part where coaches were dictating. So one of the ways of giving players back the game as you explore coaching methods is obviously play, practice, play. We all know they love to play. We all know it's a child's inherent desire to play. Part of developmentally appropriate is having a game that they can understand with enough options. That's an example, 4v4, which we went to 3v3 for younger kids so that there's more touches on the ball. There's a picture they can understand and see. Uh, so that was an enormous piece of it, the developmental, uh, developmentally appropriate piece. 
was a cornerstone of our conversation. Ask was choosing a method which we thought would give more autonomy to players, even if a coach was, it's all about me. Because if you tell a coach, okay, I understand you think it's all about you, but we're going to let them play. And then perhaps coaches make me laugh when they say, kids don't talk. Kids don't talk because coaches don't shut up. <laughs> it's the absolute truth of it. But no, if you're not wrong. We shut up, they will talk. And if you give them small enough numbers, they'll begin to solve the problem of the game together. So to a degree, it was a voyage of common sense. Yeah. Yeah. You bring up some great points there. Talk more about what you mentioned there at the end, the importance of appropriate numbers, not only at the younger levels, but even then as they progress, the importance of small sided games and giving them a picture where they can start to solve the problems. I we say to people, if you thought about designing coaching education, there's only really, well, there's three places you can start. You can start with the game, if you understand the game. You can start with personal people, so cognitive, social, physical growth. Or you can start from learning how players learn at different ages. So that's an example with five-year-olds, very simple, clear uh, instructions. They run around quickly. You don't talk for more than 30 seconds. They come back, etc. So There's only three corners you can look at. What we did was look primarily at how, what people are, so cognitive, psychosocial, physical, with a good degree of learning involved in that. Because enough of us had experience of coaching different ages that we were steeped in the practicality of it. I coach five-year-olds still on a regular basis, and I know they don't respond well to 30-minute speeches. Yes, <laughs> no doubt about that. Yeah, I think that's, that's really good and, and really important. And, and like you said, and correct me if I'm wrong here, one of the main focus was that, that people side of it, the psychosocial. And I, I'd love if you talked a little bit more about that and maybe, you know, what are some of the, some of the areas that as coaches we can just easily neglect that we really need to invest more of our energy and focus on? I think practice design is a good way to look at this. If I'm designing, I decide my team need to improve possession, I don't know, any aspect you like, and I do it in the vacuum without recognizing the needs and wants of the players in front of me, so I don't, distig, I don't think about where they are cognitively. Are they capable of hypothetical thought? Do they understand that space is important? Do they understand what if questions? Do they need to understand we need to spread out? So I don't put that piece as part of the discussion when I'm designing the session. And therefore, by extension, can Tim take advice off of Gary? Psychosocially, is he willing to take? Oh, if Gary speaks to Tim, is Tim going to suck his thumb and sulk for the next 20 minutes? Without planning all those pieces it's very difficult to design an effective training session yeah i think you're right there it's it's so important for us to consider those different factors you know in particular too the relational dynamics that exist you know especially you know if you're coaching you know at a high school for example and you've got athletes that maybe you're on the same team they've gone to school together for years and they might hate each other you know, or, or you might have ones that they've been friends for so long that that can become counterproductive to your environment as well. And we, we have got to recognize that and be intentional in our practice design sometimes of like, you know, I actually, I really need to separate these two in, in teams. These, these guys can't be on the same team. Or maybe it's these guys need to be on the same team because they need to figure out how to play together, work this out, and I'll be there to support them. But I'm recognizing the psychosocial aspect that is a, it's a key. It's a real piece of our team and our team's ability to perform at its best 
based on these relational social dynamics. And a conversation shows the interconnection of it all, because we take this back to core values, and we connect that with the psychosocial piece now, you begin to see how a great coach weaves all these pieces of the onion together. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. If, you're, you know, if one of your values is respect, then this is when you've got to, to bring it in, to highlight it, and, and to have conversations with them about, okay, you might not like Tim, but how can you respect Tim here? Yeah, and, and, and why that's so important for, for them and for the team. I think one of the greatest problems in youth sports generally is that people don't let kids solve problems. So most youth sports, when there's a problem between two little kids, the coach leaps in and referees the problem. How can we expect them to develop any social skills if we don't give them chance to sort out these issues together? And if you over-police everything and you have coach dominant, coach and I always like, I like kids at five and six sort out problems. Like you two, well, COVID's made it a bit more problematic because they now they have to recognize each other and talk to each other again, but time to give them ownership of the experience. Tell me about that with your five and six year olds. What's it look like without letting it become a five and six year old brawl? First of all, uh, you have to prime the parents because the parents are in shock. When you tell two six-year-olds, I know you've disagreed about whether that was a goal, but find a way to talk to each other to decide if you're going to play again or if you want to stand and talk about it and argue about it for 30 minutes. So parents go through this uneasy moment because they think the more policed and the more army-like, the better. So the more regimented, the better. They don't remember why they want their kids to play. And when a coach says to them, I'm going to let you sort this out, they're in shock. They run on, they want to jump up and down on the coach. But these, I mean, they're really great moments where you can help players and parents evolve. Yeah. I mean, I'm challenged by that. How can I, how can I be okay with them figuring it out? And People struggle with the time aspect. It, it, they're like, yeah, you it, let them talk for five minutes to figure that out. Yeah. And, and it's not only the time aspect. I think for me personally, I really care about the environment and the culture. Real, I mean, it, it is a priority for me every day. Like, what is this environment like? Um, I want a, an environment of, of rich psychological safety, right, between everyone, um, an environment of, of belonging and purpose, a place kids love to be. And it's hard as the coach because – you know, we don't have total control. We have influence. We don't have control over those peer-to-peer -peer relationships. And those peer-to-peer -peer relationships can really derail a team's culture. And so I think that, for me, that's the, that's the piece that, I, that is hard. You know, as, as a coach, you really are kind of the, the culture keeper or environment keeper and balancing, I'm going to ensure that this is the kind of culture that is great for kids with I need to let them sort it out. Part of that culture you create is how are we going to handle moments of stress? Mm. And you can call what's going to happen. At some point, we're going to have people who disagree, people who want to fight each other. We know that's going to happen on our team. Let's decide now how we're going to deal with those situations in a way that promotes our team, promotes our culture, and helps us be more effective. So they come up with the guardrails and that's the phrase from bowling. They come up with the guidelines, the guardrails that manage these conversations. I love that, that strategy there, the importance of just having them consider it beforehand. We know so many of the stressful situations that are inevitably going to occur in practice and in games. And just to take a minute or two to have them consider beforehand, guys, how do we want to handle disagreements with teammates? Guys, how do we want to respond when blank happens? To consider that beforehand, it's actually going to end up saving you time too as the coach because now you don't have to go into the five-minute lecture about it. We yeah. agreed on it before. Great. When I see this happen, this is what I, you can expect from me. Right? I think that that is such an important piece too of creating that environment is that, is that we do. We consider beforehand uh, how 
we're going to respond as the coach and then how the athletes say they want to respond too. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Tim, this has been fantastic. Before we wrap it up, I want to ask you three quick rapid fire questions. Uh, the first one is this, the most fun part of coaching is? Just connecting with kids to see the joy, the smile, to know that you're helping people fulfill their potential. What more noble thing can they be? Yeah, it's so good. I wish I would have known blank before my first coaching experience. How can you bottle 50 years experience? <laughs> is there one thing that comes to the top of your mind? It's not about me. Hmm, that's good. Yeah, I think that's something we all need to, if we all, if we all embrace that from the start, we'd probably uh, skip some of the headaches. And the last one is this, I know I'm successful as a coach when... Players come back to me further down the line and thank me for the experience and tell me they're coaching. Yeah, that's awesome. That's so special. Tim, this has been fantastic. I appreciate you joining me. Before we wrap it up, just share with the listeners where they can connect with you. Uh, so I do the Twitter thing, at TimBDOCI, where I meander and write monthly stuff. And they can also email me, tbradbury at emysoccer.com. Awesome. Tim, thanks so much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you. Coaches, thanks for listening to this episode, and thanks to Tim for joining me. As always, if you enjoyed this episode and you want to grab a copy of the free podcast notes, go to cuttingedgecoach.com slash podcast to download a free PDF of notes from this episode or any episode of the podcast. And don't forget to check out filmforcoaches.com to learn more or register for the upcoming online workshop I'm hosting with Doug Lamov. Spots are limited, so claim yours today. That's filmforcoaches.com. Thanks for listening to the podcast. 